really, I guess, basically finally a filmmaker. Um, I think that's what informs most of what I, what I do and what I was hired to teach at Syracuse University. Um, but having been here, I just um, finished, uh, or it's going to be 20 years um, this year that I started teaching and I got, you know, we have a recognition ceremony and I got my paper cutter from Syracuse University for being here for 20 years. Yeah, so I guess that's good. Um, uh, um, I, I do not, I do not, I, I, I did my master's uh, in filmmaking and film production at uh, Newhouse in the mid 80s. I moved to New York City um, and I worked there for 12 years as a film editor. It somehow, um, I think life works in mysterious ways. You, you sort of draw what, what you need um, to your life, I think, um, once you open it up. And uh, I started off um, doing you know, a production assistant work um, and then worked at MTV Networks as a production coordinator for VH1 and uh, Nick at Night and Nickelodeon and Nick at Night. And then, um, you know, had the opportunity to work with Mira Nair on her very first feature film, Salam Bombay, which was nominated for an Oscar award. Um, but I had also helped her edit a short film for National Film Board of Canada, which was about using amniocentesis um, uh, for sex detection uh, in India in the mid 80s, you know, so so women would find out if the child was a male or a female, and you know, abort the female uh, uh, a fetus. Um, it was, you know, after the film was made, etc. The law was, you know, we had we had laws against it, but you know, the practice still continues, and now people use sonograms to detect um, whether the child is male or female. So. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I somehow, uh, from the very beginning, got involved with films that were social justice, human rights related, and so most of the films that I ended up working on were connected to that some, somehow or the other, and then I started, you know, making conscious decisions about what kind of work I wanted to do. So, you know, I worked with Spike Lee on Do the Right Thing and Malcolm X, um, and uh, the James Ivory film was about Picasso, which was not really human rights related. In fact, it was about how badly he treated his women. Um, but even when I was a filmmaker um, in uh, New York, you know, and I was extremely busy, I helped um, start a women's organization, which is still going on um, very strong. It's called Sakhi for South Asian Women. Sakhi means a uh, women friend in various South Asian languages. Um, and it's an organization that helps um, um, survivors of uh, domestic violence and domestic abuse, and you know, so we provide a lot of services, and we're really an advocacy group. Um, we very early on decided we did not, you know, get in, want, did not want to have a shelter um, because it uh, changes the focus of, of our work. So it's really about advocacy and policy change, and we've helped a lot with that. Um, in in uh, New York, in the New York City area. Um, so as part of working with Saki, you know, we started organizing a South Asian a women's film festival. So, so the directors, filmmakers had to be from South Asia, which is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, um, and you know, sometimes Afghanistan, but not really. Yeah. So it's, it's that big chunk of, um, you know, the Indian subcontinent. So when I finally, you know, um, uh, I started teaching, I was living in New York, flying in one day a week to teach while I was editing, um, and then we end, I ended up moving here full time. And once I became full time and uh, went on the tenure track, I started thinking about things that really interest me and, you know, what else could I do? And um, um, and through that, I sort of came up with the idea of doing a human rights film festival. And, um, and I think the reason why, you know, whether at Saki or here, uh, you know, the idea of using uh, films to tell stories of uh, human rights and social justice um, is important because I think sometimes when you see it, whether it's fiction, or nonfiction, you know, it engages you more than just reading about it, right? Um, and uh, um, and also, 
I, I feel as a professor uh, really that you know my job is more than just teaching students uh, the the tricks of the trade if you want to call it, call it that um, you know um, the things that are going to help them get a job and get have a career I think it's also very important to inspire young people uh, to be a citizen of the world and and what and what is your legacy going to be when you graduate you know how are you going to become a part of you know, creating change in the world. And I think that is extremely important. And and that was sort of drilled into my head, I think, um, you know, not literally, that's a very violent uh, image, but um, I, I, I guess I learned it from from the day I was born. My, my um, father's side of the family, my great-grandparents, my grandparents were all freedom fighters against the British. My grandmother, you know, was sent to prison when she was 16 years old, um, and um, and you know she was let out early because uh, she was pre she, you know, she was pregnant with my father, and so the you know the British did not want a baby being born in the Calcutta prison. So you know that had all it had all been part of my life and my growing up. So when the opportunity came to uh, do something in New York with the women's um, organization which you know uh, some friends and I um, you know sort of brainstormed what we wanted to do and it sort of came about um, so I wanted to sort of carry on that work in Syracuse and um, uh, I went back to India in 2002 after seven years my parents were living in Singapore and um, I would lived in Geneva and then I moved to Singapore my brother was living abroad too, and so we would see each other in other parts of the world. I had not been back to India for a long time. And so when I went in 2002, I realized, you know, how much the media had changed there, how much the world had changed. And 9-11 had just happened, and so the stories that were coming out of that part of the world were, were you know, very much focused on um, terrorism and Afghanistan, etc. But it's, it's a very... Um, vital region you know this it's it's the culture there is, is you know 5,000 years old or more um, as we say and I really wanted to sort of start telling other stories so when I started the film festival the first year we did it was in 2003 um, I did it with an organization called breakthrough which um, is a human rights organization based in New Delhi and in New York City um, and uh, you know and the, um, we I was on the board of directors for many, many years. Um, and uh, so uh, one part of the work is on uh, um, you know, stopping violence against women. And then um, you know, there's many different aspects of that. And the other organization that I worked with was the Asia Society in New York City. Um, I'm, I really believe in collaborations. I don't think anything happens, you know, individually. And I think uh, the more that you can build relationships and keep them going, and use people, no, use is not the right word, but you know, um, um, talk to your talk to your friends, talk to your networks, your and you know, so uh, brainstorm some ideas and then you know, use each other's strengths to come up with something bigger. So that's how the film festival started. Um, and when we started it, it was really, you know, films from South Asia only. But then it started, you know, we started in the South Asia Center at Maxwell um, was very, very crucial in that process, you know. So we did a lot of the organizing through it, a lot of the funding came through that. And um, But as years went on, um, the Asia Society started becoming less interested in it, etc. And then we... I also started realizing that I've got to open it up because um, social justice, human rights work happens all over the world, including the United States, and um, you know to sort of make it more available to people uh, across the campus. Um, so, for you know, so now it's really um, only organized at Syracuse University. We have no partners, and we do it. It's called the Syracuse University Human Rights Film Festival. And um, you know we have stories from all over the world, uh, but we make very sure to have one program um, from America, you know, domestic. Um, though I think I, I just finished programming it, so I'm trying to think. I think we do not have a story from uh, America this year, but it's actually from Canada, so it's North American. Um, 
The film festival, I think, you know, I've, I've been very clear from the very beginning that it's really for students um, and, uh, and for professors to use in their classes. Um, and so we, uh, you know, I actually brought some, uh, the, the program from, from the very, the most recent one. Uh, this is, it's been 13 years and now we're going to into the 14th one. And um, this is, you know, so we always do to pay tribute to the fact that it, start, it started off as a South Asia Human Rights Home Festival. We always have a program from South Asia. And, uh, you know, my co-collaborator um, for many years is Professor Roger Hallis from the English department. Uh, he used to be the director of the LGBT studies program. Uh, it's a very um, important area of study for him. And, you know, uh, so we always have an LGBT uh, studies, um, oh, LGBT focused film. And then we try and think about, you know, what different regions of the world uh, we haven't screened, what kind of issues are current, um, etc. Uh, the, 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 um, the film festival happens over one weekend. It's a Thursday night opening, a Friday screening, and three screenings on Saturday. Uh, we always try and do, uh, if, if we have local partners that we, we can bring in from the community to uh, help with the panel discussions, we do that. Um, we usually have a, you know, different professors come in and be experts. Uh, we try and bring in at least one or two filmmakers to campus. Uh, many of them are international, so then what we do is we um, um, do a Skype interview with them. You know, so wherever they are in the world, we we'll Skype them in. Because I think it's very important for students uh, to be able to talk to the creator of the work uh, you know, and, and, and that has worked uh, extremely well. I'm not sure, has anybody been to the Human Rights Film Festival? No? Um, if, you, if you're not, you know, if you're here in the fall, I, I hope you come. <laughs> because I think once you've been, you sort of, you know, your mind, you sort of want to uh, do, and Park has been a supporter for, for many years, and you know, so we're very grateful for that. Um, I think, you know, I, I think um, most of the conflicts in the world are because, you know, it's about, uh, you know, it's about the in-group and the out-group and it's fear of the other. Um, and I think um, some of the most successful screenings we've had on campus is when um, we, we've screened films uh, that have opened up people's minds to the other side. Um, I remember many years ago, I think it was in 2007, um, 2007 uh, we screened a film called Leila Khalid Hijacker. Um, and it's about the first um, female hijacker um, of a plane. And, uh, and she was Palest you know, she's Palestinian and it's, it's a documentary about her. Um, and it was extremely, extremely powerful. Um, and we had the filmmaker Alina Makbul here. Uh, she is uh, she she's Palestinian, but has lives in Sweden. You know, her pair of family fled um, as refugees from there, and um, um, and it was really very you know the film is very powerful. It sort of talks about you know who is a terrorist and why you know what is what is a terrorist etc. And um, I remember there was there was a young um, student who stood up, you know, very passionately, um, and he was actually originally originally from Israel, if I'm not mistaken, or um, and you know, and sort of questioned us screening that movie, and uh, question and, and said, you know, Syracuse University is a very Jewish campus. How dare you screen this film, etc. And I think Lena really handled it very well, and she said, you know, the reason why we um, why you know I made this movie and I want other people to see it is to make people realize that there is always another side. You may not agree with the other side, but it but it exists, and you know, and and then peace can only come when you start having conversations with the other side and uh, opening it up. Um, so we we've, we've actually shown quite a few films about the Palestinian um, Israel conflict and uh, different things. Um, and we can, you know, maybe we can talk about that more in the Q&A. 
Um, the other, you know, apart from the Human Rights Film Festival, uh, for five years, uh, Roger and I did the Digital Witness Symposium, um, in which, uh, which is about digital humanities, and we brought in people to talk about different subjects. Uh, so, you know, archiving, use, using digital media to uh, do archival work. And I, I think that year uh, we talked about, we had, um, um, you know, people representing um, Sam Goober, you know, who's at Syracuse University, who does a lot of work with the Shoah Project, uh, you know, how did, how it's important it is to document oral, oral history of people who were in, um, you know, imprisoned in the Holocaust, etc. cetera. Um, so, so that's one part of my work. Uh, the other part that I've sort of, um, in the last few years, it's suddenly become the hot topic um, which I wish it wasn't, because I wish it did not exist, is a sexual assault on campus. And, um, and Catherine and I actually served together on the work, on the Chancellor's um, work group um, in 2014, right, to look into this. And now I'm on the Chancellor's task force uh, to prevent and educate about sexual assault and relationship violence. And, but you know, we, I had, I'd, I'd actually started this work even before 2014 at uh, Syracuse. Um, you may have all heard about that horrific rape of that young uh, student in New Delhi in 2012, right? She was raped on this bus and then thrown off and she ended up dying uh, finally. Um, and <clears throat> I was... Um, I was the co-director of the South Asia Center at that point, and uh, you know, and we were very concerned that uh, it, it sort of the story sort of caught everybody's imagination. There was a lot of reporting on it, but uh, people sort of started saying, you know, started feeling maybe that this sexual assault only happens in other parts of the world. But it's not true. It happens everywhere, including uh, the United States and including Syracuse University campus. I don't know if you saw the Daily Orange today. Um, um, there was a football player who was just convicted um, of two rapes in July 2015 um, at, at Syracuse University. So, um, so, so SU Rising came through that, you know, after that uh, rape in uh, Delhi in 2012, uh, we sort of decided we would do like um, a, a, a teach-in kind of, yeah, teach-in, and we had different people, including, uh, you know, a representative from the Advocacy Center, somebody from Vera House, et cetera, be part of the panel, to so sort of talk about, you know, the, the international, the global, but also the local and to tell students that we have, um, you know, resources available here. And, um, and we, what we did was we picked the date of February 14th because um, Eve Ensler, um, who's a playwright, uh, you know, has written the very famous Vagina Monologues, uh, which uh, actually Syracuse University students perform every year at Hendricks Chapel. Um, and I am the faculty advisor for that group, <coughs> Sassy. So what we did was, um, because of that, uh, in 2013, Jan uh, February, um, Eve, uh, you know, started uh, what's called One Billion Rising, to have one billion people rising um, in the world to say, stop sexual violence against women. And so we sort of connected the two and came up with the idea of SU Rising. Um, and we did a candlelight vigil. We did the panel discussion at Hendrix during the day. And in the evening, we did a candlelight vigil. And we actually did the candlelight vigil for three years, 2013, 14, and 15. And this year, the candlelight vigil is actually happening on Monday, uh, April 4th. Um, it's going to clash with the Syracuse, foot, uh, Syracuse basketball if we <laughs> get there, but I, you know. We have to sort of leave that. Who <laughs> knows? Um, who knows? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, we shall see what happens with that. Hopefully, people will show up uh, for the vigil. Uh, we're going to screen the uh, a movie, The Hunting Ground, and then you know um, have a panel and then do the vigil. So I'm I'm really excited that the vigil is going to continue. Um, it's going to be a short thing. Um, 
and you know, once again, you know, the idea of the vigil came about because I just think it's a very dramatic thing, you know, to have people uh, gathered in the darkness, you know, with, with a candle and to sort of say that we can each make a difference in some way or the other. I've been involved with, you know, other uh, vigils um, at Syracuse University including the one that happens in December, uh, you know, when uh, on the date that uh, December 21st uh, when uh, the Pan Am 103 was blown up. So, um, you know, through that, this came about. And once again, it was a collaboration between many different departments, many different um, organizations on campus. Um, should I start? I mean, I could continue talking about a lot of things, but, you know, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you sort of have to figure out, you've got to be creative about uh, figuring out, um, you know, what your strengths are, what, ex you know, what's happening in society right now, and what could you do to uh, engage people <laughs> in conversation about those things and, you know, and inspire them in, in some ways to become agents of change and to become catalysts of change themselves. Um, so, you know, like even when I do the Bollywood program, um, you know, I take students to India and, you know, we, we are going there to work with filmmakers there or, you know, make documentaries there. Um, but living in India changes them in ways that they did not even imagine. Because many of them are young students, you know, young people, and they've not really had an opportunity to travel around the world a lot. And I think uh, once they go, uh, to a country like India, which is a developing country, um, they see they see the poverty around them, or they see people living with much less than you know than Americans do, and I think it makes them start questioning, you know, starts making their minds work in ways that they wouldn't if they had not gone there. Uh, so one of the things I do when we go uh, on the trip is uh, the students keep a public blog. And I have them a blog, um, one blog before they leave about the expectations. They do two blogs a week while we're there, and then one blog when they come back. And I think the blog that when they come back is the one that it you know sort of documents. And I have them do it after they come back home. Um, really, should sort of you know shows their growth <coughs> process and you know how it's engaged them and the things that they think about and what you know. So I've taken 51 students over five different trips, and the one thing nearly everybody talks about is how little you actually really need to live and be happy with, and um, you know that's something that uh, you know we don't really think about living. And, you know, the tendency is to collect more and more, but, you know, do you really need all that? 